Hi, this is Craig Stocks here for Utah Desert Remote Observatories. You can find us online at utahdesertremote.com. And I had a few questions about this image that showed the uh, makeup of an SHO plus RGB image. And so I want to go through how that's put together in Photoshop. <music> So as with most of my images, it actually starts in PixInsight, and let's just hop over there. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over what I did in PixInsight. I, I have other videos that explain that. But this was the result from processing the uh, sulfur, hydrogen, oxygen, and R, G, and B data. Uh, I have a sulfur image that was processed, stars were removed, stretched, uh, noise reduction, and so forth, the usual workflow. That's the sulfur, this is the oxygen, and this is the hydrogen. And again, these are all uh, stretched and then saved as 16-bit TIFF images. This is the stars that were extracted by Star Exterminator from the RGB image. And this is the RGB image without the stars. And you can see some artifacts that kind of remaining from the star removal. And, there was some of that in each one of the narrowband images also, so that can be easily cleaned up in Photoshop. So once these are all processed and saved as 16-bit TIFFs, then we hop over to Photoshop, and if you've seen my videos before, you know I start by loading everything into uh, stacks and then put those layer, that layer stack into groups by element. So this is the end result. Uh, at the top we have the stars, then we have some adjustment layers, uh, then we have the RGB layer, hydrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. And you notice these are actually layer groups. So let's just close each one of these layer groups and then we'll talk about them one by one. Uh, the stars is on top, uh, those are just put back in. You can turn the stars on or off depending on whether you want a starless image or one with stars in it. Let's start at the bottom with the sulfur. And I'm just going to briefly turn off everything but the sulfur. And you can see the sulfur shows up just as red. And the reason it shows up, let's turn off the stars, the reason it shows up as red has nothing to do with the layer itself. If you remember, the layer was just a, a grayscale image, meaning it had red, green, and blue, all three in equal amounts. This levels adjustment layer isn't doing anything either. It's a layer style that's making it red. And if you double click to the right of the name on the layer group, and it's important that you do this on the group level, you can see that in the blending options dialog near the center, we have three checkboxes, one for red, one for green, one for blue. <clears throat> and I've simply turned off the green and blue check marks. If those were turned back on, we have a grayscale image. If I turn off the blue channel, then we just have red and green, which makes orange. If I turn off the green, we just have red remaining. So the way this is configured in the advanced blending options, the sulfur channel is contributing only red. The first step really in producing a natural SHO color palette is to create an SOO image. So we have oxygen next, and I'll turn that layer on. And right away, you can see that this is an SOO image now. And let's open up the oxygen and see what's going on. There's our, our data, or the image itself. And again, this is just a grayscale image. Here's a levels adjustment so that we can adjust the brightness of the uh, oxygen if we need to. And then I've got this curves adjustment layer. And one of the things I do with the curves is I will kind of fine tune the color contribution. Uh, and typically I will take a little bit of green out of the cyan for oxygen and I do that just by going to a curves adjustment layer and if you open up the RGB dialog or drop down here you can see that you can actually target individually red, green, and blue. So if I target the green channel I can actually change the curve just for green and put more or less green into that mix of green and blue. 
and I just kind of do this by eye. It's a very iterative process. We can always come back later and change it if we decide we did something that, we, that didn't turn out so well. So that gives us our starting point of an SOO image. Next we add the hydrogen. And hydrogen is a little bit different because we already have all three color channels engaged. We have red from the sulfur, uh, green and blue from oxygen. So hydrogen we want to add on top of the SOO image and we'll choose a color for hydrogen. But to add that, we're going to use the screen blending mode. And what the screen blending mode does is it kind of adds, it doesn't really, but it's kind of like adding whatever was in the hydrogen data to the underlying whatever color it was, whatever mix it was. So <clears throat> here's our hydrogen, and this layer group is in screen blending mode. Screen is a pretty strong blending mode. It tends to have a lot of effect, so you typically will need to kind of dial down the brightness of, the, uh, of this hydrogen layer using a levels adjustment layer. And the midpoint slider just adjusts the overall brightness up and down. The black point slider on the left just adjusts the black point, how, how dark is the darkest and the white point slider adjusts how white is the, or how bright is the brightest. I have a curves adjustment layer, just like I did with oxygen, and I do somewhat the same thing. Since this was, again, an RGB image with all three channels, and I haven't turned any of the channels off, what I do is I use this curve to decide what color I want the hydrogen to be. And you can see that we've adjusted both the green and the blue curve. If we go to the blue first, uh, that's just deciding is this going to have more blue or more yellow. And I will usually turn it down fairly low uh, so that we get more of an orange color from the hydrogen. And then the green, uh, and again this determines how much yellow or green is going to be in the hydrogen. Do we want it a lot different from the sulfur or do we want it uh, very similar. and In reality the two are very similar. They're both a very dark red color, um, but if you just use the actual color you won't be able to see the difference. And, and we do want to see the difference between where there's hydrogen and where there's sulfur, but we want to do it in the most natural way that we can. So this is just adjusted, kind of adjusted to taste, and this gives us now a natural SHO image where we have the sulfur and oxygen mapped as red for sulfur, green and blue for oxygen, and then we've laid hydrogen on top of that in a screen blending mode and adjusted the, the color to be kind of an orange. And if I solo just this hydrogen group by alt-clicking on the eyeball, you can see that's what it looks like by itself. Uh, because it's in screen blending mode and has a kind of an outsized effect, uh, it looks pretty dark, but, th but that's okay because when you turn it on, it has the effect that we want. Adding the RGB is the last step, and if we look at just the RGB, <clears throat> it has a lot of good detail in the uh, this reflection nebula, this dust that surrounds the trifid, and that's not oxygen, that's more dust than oxygen. Uh, so it doesn't show up real well in the uh, O3 data. So what we want to do is, wherever this is nice and bright, we want to include that. <clears throat> but where it's dark, we have better information coming from our natural SHO. And to accomplish that, we use lighten blending mode. And when I turn the other layers back on, and let's turn on the RGB, you can see what's happening is the RGB data is used to brighten what's below, but it doesn't darken anything. And that allows us to really reveal this dark nebula over here on the right. It brings out the dust in the background and just kind of completes the image. Then I've got just some global adjustment layers for levels, color balance, hue saturation. This last layer I almost always use is just a solid color fill layer at about uh, 18, 18, 18. This one has to be at 20. And this is in lighten blending mode, and what it does is it creates kind of a floor level. Nothing in the image will be darker than wherever this is set 
and I usually find somewhere around 17, 18 is a, a comfortable place to be. If it's not having any effect, then that means that the darks are probably too bright. And then I'll go back to this global levels adjustment layer and maybe pull those darks down just a little bit so that this solid layer is having just a little bit of an effect. We want it to have some effect on the uh, the darkest areas and just you know, now it's starting to just have a little bit of effect. It's mostly probably knocking out noise in these darkest areas. The last step then would be to turn the stars back on and there we have a finished image. So if you like this kind of content, uh, be sure to like and subscribe to the YouTube channel because this is you know, generally the way I work in Photoshop. Uh, it is evolving, so you know, six months from now it may be a little bit different. Uh, but I've, I've kind of come to this way of working as a nice, uh, very fast, uh, very intuitive visual way of color mapping narrow band data. If you really like this sort of content, uh, we do have a workshop coming up later this year in uh, set here in St. George. Uh, myself and Christian Sase will be teaching the workshop. Uh, and it's kind of unique because it includes both uh, deep sky astrophotography as well as Milky Way photography. So you can go to the Utah Desert uh, Remote website at utahdesertremote.com. On the, the home page, there is a link there to uh, go to the details about the master class. And that's going to be September 10th through the 15th here in St. George. Uh, kind of a unique opportunity to really immerse yourself in all sorts of astrophotography. I hope you found this useful. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments below. And as always, I hope you have a great day today and an even better night tonight under a clear dark sky. Thanks.